Good viewer, you are watching exert us. This is because exert us makes you feel good, makes you feel fulfilled. You are enjoying this. You will continue to watch exert us for a long time to come. You want to subscribe to exert us, and you will. You will like and subscribe and share. You will tell your friends. Tell your friends about exert us. Your friends will come to like exert us, much as you are liking this right now, as we speak. Thank you for subscribing to exert us. See, that was easy. This next story has been suppressed by mainstream media. Let's go to Andreas for more. Everybody, tune in to Recent Tartarian. Recent Tartarian. Recent Tartarian. Hello. Welcome to the Exertos. Tune in for another exciting episode of Wonder, Imagination and Discovery. Recent Tartarian. Sometimes I look at the moon and just think, this thing's beautiful. Baby, when I met you, there was peace on no. Что касается энергии Нэнэни, то она превышает ядерную в немыслимое число раз. 1074 степени. Thank you for watching Exodus. Keep listening. Remember if you enjoyed the video please follow and subscribe and share and support, it really helps. Coming up next, Exetos. By the way that's gone, if you didn't record that, that's gone forever. It's gone. Well, I'm, I'm, I hope you're all right after that, but welcome to the show. One of our favorite people, one of the very serious people out there. So I don't know how he handled that intro, but Janati, uh, Stoy, 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 Stoyarov, Stoyarov. There we go. I did it right. Stoyarov, the second. How are you? Doing well. It has been a busy year for the U.S. Transhumanist Party. Certainly many events, many undertakings are afoot. That's right. The world is changing so fast. Artificial intelligence is uh, gaining traction, you know, and it's it's going to start facilitating all sorts of very rapid improvements. Let me quickly introduce everyone. Now that you know our friend, let me introduce you to the enemy. This is the enemy. So the enemy, I think, I'm I'm more and more convinced is aging. It's a uh, I get why people think it's honorable to age. It's honorable to die, you know, and all that. And I think it's great if you choose to die. Like I think Harikari and Seppuku, we could bring it back. But Alzheimer's disease and these kinds of things, age uh, produces these these age related diseases. And I think age related diseases are pretty much the enemy. I don't know. What do you think about that? I definitely agree. I think a lot of people have this misconception that aging is some sort of graceful, peaceful process and that most people can expect to die in their sleep when they're 90. In fact, for the vast majority of people, the period of time when they are in good health, when they feel energetic, when they feel productive, when they feel like they're enjoying life is considerably shorter than that. And the reason why people die is because of a large variety of chronic diseases, cardiovascular diseases, cancers, diabetes, dementia. And the vast majority of these diseases are also highly correlated with biological aging. So people who are biologically young have a very low probability of getting them. People who are biologically old, on the other hand, have an orders of magnitude higher probability of getting those diseases. So there's nothing beautiful or graceful about biological aging. Now, there's nothing bad about getting older chronologically, about attaining life experience and wisdom and knowledge, and those would continue in a post-aging world. 
we in the transhumanist party would like to reach a world where people are biologically young while they continue to get chronologically older. Yeah, I, th I think people miss that um, as a major point. And also, it's interesting because we're even having this conversation that we have to say, is aging okay? Or it could, because people, I think if you were to say, like, is it all right for a child to die? Most people would say it's probably better if we could stop it. If we could stop a child's death, we should. But then there gets to this idea of of suffering. Well, maybe suffering comes along with the back. And yeah, sure, maybe some suffering does. But is it wrong and how right is it to spend so much effort trying to mitigate suffering, right? Isn't that kind of the point of the United States Transhumanist Party is to mitigate as much suffering as possible? Yes. So we strive to advocate for the use of science and technology to improve the human condition in every way that is available and to overcome the age-old problems that have plagued humankind ever since our species came to be. We are finally on the cusp within our lifetimes of actually solving these problems and getting rid of tremendous amounts of human suffering. Also, this idea of aging is kind of elastic, right? So some people considered at some point in history 35 to be a good time to die. I think some people still do. But in the future, we might think 90 or 120 or whatever. But isn't it true that right now some of the uh, life expectancy, particularly in the U.S. and some countries, is going down, not up? Yes. And there are several causes for this. First of all, the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, has claimed about 1.1 million lives in the U.S. and another. now over 6 million lives throughout the world. And that has reduced life expectancy. But there are certain subpopulations in the United States where life expectancy had been declining even before the pandemic. And this has especially been the case among middle-aged Caucasian people, which is uh, really quite startling. But a lot of those people have succumbed to what are considered deaths of despair, either through drug abuse or alcoholism or suicide. And actually, we saw a similar pattern of such deaths of despair in the 1990s after the collapse of the Soviet Union in right. the former Soviet countries, where the male life expectancy actually plunged into the 50s for a few years. The female life expectancy stayed quite a bit higher, but the men were more likely to abuse alcohol in that society. So it is troubling that we have a large segment of the American population, which seems to have lost a sense of meaning and purpose. And that's not because there's no meaning or purpose to be had in the world. It is because the culture has failed them. It is because the predominant philosophical and political paradigms have failed them. And transhumanism hopefully will offer a superior source of meaning to them and reinvigorate their desire to live as well. So in terms also of uh, diet, it's interesting to think about like we're living these some people are living these lives of despair, which are uh, causing irreparable harm to their DNA and to the elasticity of their DNA and to causing premature aging. Um, so do you think that that's a major issue that transhumanism faces? It's not just about genetic modification. It's even just about diet. It's just about trying to live healthier. Is that a big part of it, too? I think transhumanism aims to encourage the improvement of length of life and quality of life through whatever means are available. And there's a great physician named Dr. Terry Grossman. We've interviewed him on our U.S. Transhumanist Party Virtual Enlightenment Salon. He also co-wrote two books with the famous futurist and AI scientist Ray Kurzweil. And he has formulated the idea of essentially three bridges to longevity escape velocity. And the first bridge is healthy lifestyle. Everything that essentially a common sense understanding of good, healthy living would convey, regular exercise, a good diet, a good amount of sleep, uh, everything that people ought to strive toward often do fall short of. But especially if you're older biologically and chronologically, you need to engage in those habits as well as abstaining from risky activities or self-destructive activities, consumption of a lot of recreational drugs or a lot of alcohol. That is essential to get you to the point 
where scientific advances will enable the reversal of biological aging. So bridge two would be biotechnology, rejuvenation treatments like the SENS approach advocated by Dr. Aubrey de Grey, which stands for Strategies for Engineered Negligible Senescence, where hopefully within 15 years uh, or so, therapies will be developed to repair all of the main types of aging damage. And of course, once the therapies are developed, it still takes time to make them available in the clinic to patients, especially because we have a very cumbersome bureaucratic approval process. So maybe in 20 or 25 years, the vast majority of patients will start seeing the benefit of those therapies. Until then, we need to stay alive. We need to stay healthy through whatever means are available. And then bridge three, according to Grossman and Kurzweil, is nanotechnology. And nanotechnology will enable really effective repair of damage at the cellular level because you could have nanobots patrolling your body, essentially detecting damage, repairing it on the spot, and you could have essentially live status metrics about the condition of your body, the condition of your various systems, what you need in terms of maintenance, and hopefully that will be available within 40 to 50 years. I would be very disappointed if the technology does not progress to the point where in 40 to 50 years we will have nanobots patrolling uh, our bloodstream, detecting damage to cells. However, again, we need intermediate strategies to stay alive until that time. Right. Well, we got a couple uh, couple interesting super chats. One of them sounds like a reference to the Unabomber, <clears throat> um, which I guess means that they're more of the Luddite class. The other one says only the elite will have access to the tech. And I think you mentioned a few things about that, about immediately this the circumstances that are keeping the technology from us. And I find that an interesting comment because they're saying, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, this exists or it can exist. And I believe that it could be good, but I won't have access to it. Right. So what are you mentioned bureaucracy and some of the reasons it's, it's hard to just put out a technology without testing it. But what are some of the reasons why it's in the hands of the elite, not in the hands of people? And why, you know, someone who thinks that way would really want to be a member of the United States Transhumanist Party? Yes. So there is nothing about the natural development of technology that precludes it from being accessible to everyone. So this is a fairly ordinary cell phone, a Google Pixel 7, and it is much more powerful than the mobile phones that were available to the elite in the 1990s. Indeed, if you remember seeing those bulky, large cell phones that essentially could only make very poor quality phone calls, but they were considered status symbols for millionaires and billionaires. And yet, right now, even a subsistence farmer in sub-Saharan Africa could have access to a better quality phone. Perhaps not a Pixel 7, but definitely a phone that would have been top of the line, say, 10 years ago. And those individuals have access to essentially the vast majority of the information in the world for free, even though they might have trouble accessing clean drinking water sometimes. They have access to this cutting edge technology because of essentially how these technologies spread. If you have a truly free competitive market in the development and production of these technologies, they don't stay relegated to an elite. Indeed, there is a great incentive to make them available to larger and larger segments of the population. Now, early on, when the technology is in its infancy, essentially the prototypes or the first versions of that technology may be quite expensive and may only be accessible to a few. But again, it doesn't stay that way because businesses want to make profits and they want to expand their customer base. And these elite first recipients of the technology are essentially test subjects. They, through their user experience, get to identify all of the bugs in the technology, all of the aspects that could be improved. So over time and over increasingly shorter amounts of time with each generation of technology, the technology becomes disseminated to greater and greater numbers of people. It becomes cheaper. And ultimately, 
uh, in its mature stage, the technology becomes either very inexpensive or virtually free. So uh, for instance, with email or digital music, those are essentially free now for people. And we recall, at least people in my generation recall a time when you had to pay for an email subscription back in the 1990s. So we can see examples of how this technology becomes abundant, but there are barriers. And those barriers are largely through bad policy. So if you have a system like the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, which takes an average of 10 to 15 years and several billion dollars to approve a new drug or approve a new medical device. That is what holds back availability of treatments, not just for the large numbers of ordinary people. Even the wealthy have to go abroad sometimes to get the benefit of cutting edge treatments. And those cutting edge treatments are necessarily on a smaller scale. They're experimental because sometimes those countries just don't have the resources. They don't have the facilities to really scale it up. So this very cumbersome and sometimes quite draconian approval process at the FDA really slows down the dissemination of these technologies and keeps medical care artificially expensive. There are other reasons why medical care is artificially expensive, like the certificate of need laws that prevent new hospitals from being constructed in certain areas unless the existing hospitals that would be their competitors essentially agree to uh, have some more competition. And clearly, often they do not agree to that. And there are a lot of other restrictions within the medical system that prevent our technological potential, even the potential that exists today, from being fully realized. So the Transhumanist Party is definitely fighting against those barriers. We are fighting for policy reforms that would make it easier and faster for life extending technologies to reach the vast majority of ordinary people. I'm not one of the elites. So I, in my personal interests, would want to see this technology arrive for everyone sooner rather than later. Yeah, we can think of a couple of examples, obviously. I mean, any any uh, Sovietism uh, or, or any rep reproduction of a technology, I mean, Linux and all of the software that's been made available, um, the different kinds of AI that's been made available, like, uh, you know, chat GPT becoming stable GPTs and all these different things. Like, we're very quickly seeing duplicates that are very similar because once you understand the concept, the concept can be reproduced. Um, but yeah, it's also true that we're being held back from... Uh, experimental technology, experimental medicine and things like that. That's also holding back the elite. I mean, the elite would have to go to an island, which makes a very small amount of elite that can even do that. Plus the uh, pharmaceutical companies themselves. Now you're saying it has to be a company that can afford to go through all this process to even release the drug. So if you're a doctor, you, you aren't going to make an open source medicine or a novel chemist. You're going to go work for La Roche or something like that. So we're, we're trapped into these paradigms. Do you think that um, the United States Transhumanist Party is looking to open up the experiments to a level that is, is there going to be a danger? Like, where's the level of boundary? We're hearing some Luddites in the crowd, right? Where's the level of boundary to protect? Because if you make it available, then the first thing they're going to do is experiment on the poorest people that are about to die, right? You'd be like, okay, well, this person doesn't have a very viable chance with traditional medicine. Let's give them the experimental treatment. And it would very quickly move things forward. But wouldn't that also be kind of dangerous? You know, what kind of checks and balances do you believe we should have? I think there needs to be informed consent. I think patients of every background need to have good disclosure of what treatments are available, what the likely outcomes are, what the possible side effects are. And the disclosure needs to be made in a manner that is accessible to a layperson. So I sometimes see various warning labels on medications and fine print and many, many pages of inserts. And I think this could be much better written in order to accurately disclose what the major benefits and major possible side effects are in a balanced way. That doesn't happen as often today as it should, but I would definitely be in favor of 
doctors and other medical practitioners essentially having these conversations with patients and saying, look, if we were to pursue the established standard of medical care, you are likely to die with a certain probability. There's this experimental treatment that could lower your probability of death or give you the chance of a cure. And here is the probability of that as far as we know. But there are some unknowns. There are some possible side effects. It could be that X, Y, or Z could happen to you. Do you want to take the chance? And if the patient says, yes, I want to take the chance, I think those wishes should be respected. If the patient says no, then obviously those wishes should be respected as well. But I think a lot of people, especially in these kinds of situations where mainstream medicine has given up on them, are quite willing to take the chance. And we need to respect their right to do so. Also, I think it's important to acknowledge there are different degrees of risk tolerance within the population, depending on where one is at in one's life. So in some ways, it's the reverse of people's investment appetites. So when people are younger, they tend to invest more aggressively because they have more time to recoup any losses. When they're older, they want to preserve their capital so that they have essentially a guarantee of income and assets to live on. Now, the reverse is true for medical treatments. When one is younger and still in good health, one has more to lose if there's an adverse side effect from a medical treatment. So I would advise for younger people, especially like people under 40, to be very cautious about any sort of medical treatments that are far outside of the mainstream, especially if one is healthy and doesn't have any obvious signs of problems. On the other hand, people who are getting biologically older, who have various chronic conditions, various comorbidities, they have more to lose by not doing anything. So they could afford to be more experimental in terms of the treatments that they pursue. And they should have the right to do that as well. It's interesting also um, in terms of older people that would be interested in newer technology, right? That's kind of, uh, it's it's almost paradoxical, but it's it's very natural as well. Do you think though that, like you said earlier, people think of aging as graceful. Do you think there's a reason why young people are, I feel like people are isolated from each other more. People maybe aren't interacting with their grandparents as much or something, but do you feel like people are unaware of this wall of aging that's is hitting them? That's a, a big part of this. Yes. I think this has been a major cultural problem in the United States, especially for several generations in that there has been so much age-based segregation, essentially ever yeah. since kindergarten, people are, essentially funneled into large peer groups where they're only interacting with people who are essentially exactly their age. Maybe once they enter their 20s, that age range broadens to a few years in either direction, but they don't really have perspective uh, as to what the prior generations are experiencing. I even think it would be beneficial for someone like me to go to a high school, for instance, and speak to a class of students and tell them, well, here is everything that is likely to happen to you by the time you're 30 or by the time you're 35, which for whatever mysterious reason the adults in your life have not taught you, or you haven't spent enough time around the adults in your life because you have been relegated to only interacting with your peer group. And I find that the vast majority of young people are quite ill-equipped to anticipate what is coming, and so they don't make rational, long-term oriented decisions. If they had more interaction with older people, not only would they get the benefit of more knowledge and perhaps access to more opportunities, but they would also have the benefit of the foresight to see, okay, these long periods of chronic disease, disability, suffering are to be expected. So what am I to do about it now? How should I start to live my life now so that this doesn't happen to me or so that I can at least minimize the blow if and when it does happen to me? Eat your vitamin pills, right. Um, in terms of death, so I think we've covered this a bit in the past, but just it's still an interesting idea. If more and more people were to start living longer and longer, would you see that as being a population problem eventually? I would not for several reasons. First of all, 
the Earth's carrying capacity is not actually finite. Resources are not a function of just how much fixed stuff there is. Resources are a function of the human mind, of human ingenuity. The right. human mind, as the great 20th century economist Julian Simon has stated, is the ultimate resource. So the more great minds we have, the more ability we have to harness the physical stuff of nature into useful resources. Oil used to be a pollutant in the 19th century until entrepreneurs like John D. Rockefeller figured out first how to use it for heating in mass, and then later on when the internal combustion engine was invented, how to use it to power vehicles. And of course, we have so much energy from the sun. We have energy that we can harness through cheap, safe, nuclear power through the next generation nuclear power plants if we can remove the regulatory barriers to their construction. And likewise, with regard to space. So we have 8 billion people on Earth right now. Actually, they could all comfortably fit within a land area. Uh, the size of Australia. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. <laughs> and, and that's Australia, just surface area. We're not right. even thinking about vertical or digging into, uh, a basement for these people. Exactly. <laughs> but what is happening right now is that the population of Earth, while it is still growing, the rate of growth is decelerating because mm -hmm. the rate of reproduction uh, is declining everywhere in the world. It's just that in some places, it is at a higher level initially. So in sub-Saharan Africa or in the Middle East, populations are still growing, but the number of children per woman has declined from, say, seven or eight in some countries to three or four. And that decline is continuing, whereas in Western European countries or in countries like Japan or South Korea, the population growth is already below replacement. So in some of those countries, populations are actively declining as right. in Japan. And there are several possible solutions to this. One is greater automation so that you could have more labor performed by robots, including robots that take care of the elderly. Another is immigration. And that seems to be the solution in a lot of the Western European countries. Japan, uh, for whatever reason, culturally is averse to that. But in Western Europe, in the United States, it is the immigration that is keeping the total populations up. But Again, if in the countries from which the immigrants are coming, the birth rates are already declining, this can only go on for several generations. The third solution, I think, is the one that is actually going to solve this problem without leading to a population collapse, and that is radical life extension and reversal of biological aging, so that we can keep the people who are alive now alive indefinitely and productive and energetic and youthful, and we won't have a crisis with elder care. We won't have a crisis with the pension systems. We won't have a crisis with Medicare or other public health systems that may collapse under the weight of this demographic imbalance. Instead, we'll have more people in good health, not needing to expend large amounts of resources because the rejuvenation treatments will be less expensive than the palliative care essentially required to keep people alive in older age today. So I think in order to address the threat of demographic collapse, which I think is much more imminent than the threat of overpopulation, we need radical life extension. Right. Well, uh, someone wanted you to recite the Lord's Prayer, prayer in Russian. I'm not going to make you do that. Uh, but uh, but uh, maybe on that vein, for a super chat for 10 from Devotee, thank you, says, Transhum is the transhumanist perspective only material or, or which, are there considerations of the soul? I think that kind of plays into this a bit. What do you think about that? Yes. So transhumanism is a big tent in terms of conventional philosophical and religious perspectives. There's no dogma of transhumanism in terms of theology or metaphysics. Now, I myself am an atheist. I don't think there is a existence, any sort of afterlife after this life. I think we do have an identity, a consciousness, what I call the i -ness, and some people might equate that to the soul. It's essentially one's vantage point upon the world, the sense that one has of being oneself and not another person. So I perceive the world as me and not as you. You perceive the world as you and not as me. But I think this requires 
the continuity of the biological organism and the processes within that organism. It's an emergent property of a particular biological life process, of course, with the kinds of systems that we humans have. So perhaps some simpler animals, uh, worms, for instance, they might be able to sense light, but I don't know how much of an inus they have. However, there are transhumanists who have more explicitly religious perspectives. There are sure. transhumanists. There are Mormon. Mormon transhumanists. transhumanists. Yes. Yeah. There are Buddhist transhumanists, Jewish transhumanists, a few Muslim transhumanists, some uh, more generally spiritual transhumanists. Half of who, India doesn't even know they're transhumanists yet, you know? Yeah, it's interesting because I think there is a bit of sympathy to transhumanism in India. I recently also had a guest on our virtual enlightenment salon, our vice chairman, Arun Vahanian, who had traveled extensively to in India, China, Japan. And what he said was, in terms of China, for instance, there is a prevalent Confucian ideology, but Confucianism isn't a religion or a dogma either. So Confucianism could be compatible with transhumanism as well. And likewise, in Japanese society, there is less of a hardline distinction between technology and nature. So right. Japanese Zen. Shinto. Yeah. Japanese residents would be less likely to think that a robot is anything scary or unnatural because a robot is just part of uh, what is possible within nature. And so Japanese restaurants, for instance, have uh, often adopted robots to provide service or in, uh, say, elder care settings in Japan, there are robots that uh, are designed to communicate with the elderly and essentially entertain them or help them out with daily tasks. And that's not considered frightening to uh, the most, uh, the vast majority of people in Japan uh, in the least. So I think there is a possibility for people of a wide array of religious and philosophical perspectives to embrace transhumanism. It's just a matter of how it's communicated. And we try to be a big tent for those people. If you believe in a soul, if you don't believe in a soul, you're still welcome in our movement because it's about what you support being done in this world to improve the human condition. Right. I, I think what you said is really important too, because you know you weren't um, stepping on anyone's beliefs. However, you're also talking about your own understanding of the I-ness that we're talking about. And I think that um, there is something to that. When Buddhists talk about reincarnation, they're not talking about you remembering your mind, your memories from your life necessarily. Sometimes that can be, you can get like a little veil of one, but for the most part, your body and mind are different than your, the energy. And it sounds like you believe in atoms and energy. So that's pretty compatible as far as I can tell material and energy and soul and all that. It seems like it's more of a question of personification and personification is also interesting because as we talked about the Shintoists, it, they're believing in this idea of, 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 comp, of, um, furthered complexity that's giving you opportunity giving consciousness opportunity so i don't know i think as we get further into this this argument between atheism and theism are going to be irrelevant as we establish better terms right because it's just more and more complexity along the way um you can respond to that sorry if you yes want. well it's interesting to consider what technology may help to bring about so for instance a lot of Christian theology focuses on resurrection, except it's actually a misunderstanding of Christian theology to say that this resurrection will be in some ethereal spirit world. That's more of a Neoplatonist concept. Yeah, it was super material originally. Right. Yeah. Yes, it was supposed to be resurrection in the flesh. Yeah. And I look at, for instance, the cryonics movement. And cryonics, for those who do not know, proposes to take people who are legally dead like and, walt disney <laughs> well walt disney actually was not prior preserved that was a myth but uh, there have been people who have been uh, famously for instance ted williams oh yeah and these people essentially are kept at extremely low temperatures to prevent uh, further degeneration of their bodies and the structures that make up their brains they're preserved typically using a technique called vitrification 
And right now, there's no way to undo the effects of that cryopreservation. But in 50 years or 100 years, perhaps there will be. And when technology advances sufficiently, if we have their bodies, their brains preserved, perhaps we could resurrect them in the flesh. And people who think about this creatively, non-dogmatically, could see this as a realization of Christian theology. So I think there is a lot of possibility for religious interpretations to evolve in right. response to technological advances. Yeah, I think some people love the idea of um, how simple things are on a spiritual side of things. Like, oh, it's just a spirit. It'll all be taken care of. But it is important to remember just like the wording of everything. Like it literally does say in the flesh. And it's a major reason why like Rastafarians, for instance, like Bob Marley wouldn't amputate his toe because he thought there would be no uh, resurrection with amputation. Like a, this is a very strongly held belief by a lot of uh, certain kinds of uh, Coptic and Ethiopian Christians as well, believe in that idea of physical resurrection. But even in terms of uh, substrate independence, right? So you're not talking about the soul necessarily, but just the memories in the mind, um, something going from one case to another case. It, what do you think about substrate independence uh, in transhumanism, moving from one body to another? Yes. So there are many schools of thought about this. I tend to favor the more careful approach, which states that, yes, it may be possible to transition from one sub substrate to another, but it has to be a gradual stepwise process, which doesn't interrupt the continuity of the particular organism or this instance of life. So let me give you an example. If a copy of you were to be instantiated one atom at a time, essentially through some futuristic technology right next to you, but you were still sitting where you are, that person clearly would not be you. That person would be a copy. That person could go off and do different things and have different awareness of the world, a different I-ness. That person may have your memories, essentially. That person might think himself to be you, but you're still sitting here talking to me. So if that person goes off and then you're destroyed, clearly you have not been transferred over to that person. Your I-ness, your experience of the world is still going to end. So I don't advocate that. That's essentially what destructive mind uploading would be. However, let's say you start to senesce and some of the neurons in your brain start to die. And by that time, there is enough technological knowledge to create artificial neurons that could be grafted one at a time or a few at a time onto your brain to replace those dead neurons. And they have the time to integrate into your brain, into your cognitive system. They start participating in that set of processes that is you. And then essentially over time, more and more of your neurons are replaced in this fashion. You continue to live your life. You continue to accumulate memories and experiences. And an increasing fraction of your brain is artificial. Could there be a point at which you have a 100% artificial brain, a different substrate, and maybe you've had other organs replaced, you've had other body parts replaced as well. So you're essentially an android at that point in time, but you have had that continuity of experience and you have this sense that it's still you. That I think could preserve the individual. Now, my question is, is that going to be the way by which most people reach indefinite life extension? Or will the biological approaches, like the SENS approach, succeed first, perhaps aided by nanotechnology, aided by essentially supplementary artificial components rather than artificial components that replace your core systems? I'm rooting I, for I'm rooting for sense, and I think that could happen pretty yes. quickly, actually. You know. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> I I am too. I actually am inclined to think that the biological route will happen more quickly than this kind of gradual artificial replacement route. But I don't rule out 
the gradual artificial replacement route either. I just think it needs to be performed very carefully. And it wouldn't suffice to just take a bunch of information about your brain and upload it into a computer because that's going to be a copy. That might be a simulation of you. That's not going to be you. But uh, in terms of the general possibility of substrate independence, I would say it's possible with a sufficiently gradual transfer where the new substrate is analogous to the old substrate in terms of preserving all of one's experiences and range of capabilities. And somebody was asking about I guess they could skip that. I mean, I think they're, you're looking, someone's asking about the connection. I think the transhumanism is not transgenderism. Uh, just so you know, I mean, like, I think you're looking for another, this, this is the United States transhumanist party. I think you're looking for a different political party. That's the Democrats. But um, in terms of the USTP, you guys are pretty open-minded, obviously. And, yes. you know, there are transgendered people. I'm sure that are transhumanists, you know, sure. as well. You know. Sure. Absolutely. But the prefix trans, and uh, I'm just astonished that I still have to say I know, that's what I was saying about. This. Uh. The prefix trans in Latin means either beyond or through. So you had, for instance, the transcontinental railroad that was finished in 1869 that went across the American continent. And it's clearly not the case that the transcontinental railroad was about changing gender or that the people who rode on it somehow uh, Netflix, came. I'm worried about Netflix doing it now. <laughs> it, yeah, it, it's just, I think, an overly simplistic kind of presentist focus that a lot of people have because they hear transgender movements covered in the news and they see the prefix trans and they think that's all it is. But really, we use that prefix all the time in words like transport, transform. Don't tell me that that's about changing gender. It's not. So transhumanism simply means going beyond the limitations of humanity, the historic limitations, but also it means that through our humanity, we achieve a better situation in life. We achieve a better world, a better civilization, more possibilities, less suffering. That's what transhumanism is about. I mean, I wish we dressed like the Matrix more. I think like one in 600 uh, has colored hair at this point but like we could that's the thing transhumanists could do is have like more of a look i get it and maybe that's part of the thing is people are seeing the transgender movement has a look to it and they're like this is different um maybe we just don't have we're not different enough of a look because we're not trying to become something else we're just trying to be as human as possible but it doesn't that doesn't ring people don't get that they think it means something like become spider people right i mean right transhumanism really is about extending the possibilities for ordinary humans. We want it to be very conventional, very respectable. Of course, there could be a different aesthetic from the contemporary mainstream. I think that's perfectly reasonable. Cultural aesthetics evolve over time, and sometimes they devolve, I think, in many respects, say in the Western world since the 1960s, cultural aesthetics have devolved and perhaps it's time for an overhaul. Now, there are many in the transhumanist community who are fond of games like Deus Ex Human Revolution. And those games have a certain aesthetic, uh, a kind of technological futuristic aesthetic that could be embraced. And I'm all in favor of retrofuturistic aesthetics if you think back to the golden age of science fiction in the 1940s through approximately the 1970s and the kinds of worlds that those authors portrayed yeah. the 2020s people... looked way better in the 1940s it's true yes yes absolutely so let's gather inspiration from those kinds of aesthetics and see what we can create and try to make it mainstream there's no reason why say the way people tend to be dressed today or the prevailing architecture of our contemporary world 
need to stay that way in the decades to come. But I don't think it needs to be anything jarring either. So uh, I don't think that that futuristic aesthetic is going to be uh, everybody wearing pink wigs or tutus or whatnot. Uh, I think it's going to be something quite a bit more sensible and more interesting. A bunch of transgendered Scots and their pink skirts just got upset. Someone says Satan hates humanity and he wants to destroy us. I think that's another example of why transhumanism seems like very godly in that sense, because it's the opposite of destroying humans. It's trying to keep humans around a long time. Someone said I replaced my cat with a Tamagotchi, which is very elf. But we've been going a lot into the personal philosophies, and I love that. But it's also important to remember that the, a major reason why the Transhumanist Party exists is because it's actually doing things. It's trying to make changes in the world. We're not just talking about what we think the world should be like. Janai is here trying to actually put together um, – uh, there's a ticket, like a ballot ticket of representatives that would probably be very good to, uh, in, to, in, to vote for if you were going to vote. Um, this is a great way to educate yourself. What are some of the things from the USTP – I'll pull up the page we had earlier. Um, here is also the yeah the endorsement ticket. Yes, absolutely. So we selected our presidential and vice presidential candidates for the 2024 election cycle earlier this year. Tom Ross is our U.S. presidential candidate, and Daniel Tweed is our vice presidential candidate. You can see our candidates page here on our website with some nice graphic designs by. Tom Ross. He used to be a creative director for a major uh, radio company in the United States. And he uh, creates a lot of these interesting memes about transhumanism and the possibilities of emerging technologies. And Daniel Tweed is his vice presidential running mate. He also ran three times for city council in Thousand Oaks, California on a transhumanist platform. But Tom Ross's main focus in this campaign is actually to help people realize the unique advantages of their humanity. And instead of fearing emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, he encourages people to embrace the opportunities and also see the complementary role that humans can play, all of the advantages that we have that AI still doesn't and will not have for right. a long time. And instead of being adversarial toward AI, a collaborative relationship with AI is actually going to help us improve our prospects as humans to a much greater extent. Yeah. I was just thinking about something um, that Tom, Tom had said. It was, uh, it was talking about like, so humans and and I've thought this as well, humans in nature will uh, not be able to see as well as an Eagle. Right. And so we invent binoculars and eventually telescopes so that can see the stars better than an Eagle. Humans don't have enough fur so then we invent jackets that are better, that can deal with subthermal temperatures better than a bear. Um, and so technology is one of the major human strengths, but it's also, it's also symptomatic. It's symptomatic of the fact that we have problems. We have these things that we, you know, we have a, a canvas that's limited. And so from there, we have to expand beyond it. But it seems it's interesting because the most natural thing then for a human is to work with tools work with technology that is an inherent human uh, trait so it's the only and it's the only way forward if we're trying to fix broken government broken civility broken society right yes absolutely indeed technology and the advancement of technology is part of human nature it's not unnatural in the least it is what we humans do and i would say transhumanism is also part of what it means to be human because part of what it means to be human is to try to overcome our limitations, to try to improve our situation. We and our ancestors have been trying to do that ever since humanity came to be. It's just that our ancestors did not have tools that were nearly as effective, but uh, you bet they 
really utilized fire. They really utilized stone tools right. when they uh, finally arrived at them. They utilized written language. They utilized agriculture. They utilized industrial technology. And all of that helped tremendously to overcome the severe vulnerabilities of our ancestors in unaided settings. Because yes, most predators out there could outrun us uh, and they have certain elements of their bodies that enable them to be more resilient against the animals, uh, against the elements and of course other creatures. We have technology as our distinguishing advantage. And of course we need to perpetuate that. We need to expand the scope of that advantage. That is what transhumanism is about. I think I'm going to change the title of this video to a movement for the future of humanity because, or a movement for humanity, you know, because that is the, the movement for humanity. It seems like that's the issue. Um, and in general, obviously it's hard to win elections and we're going to have a lot of push from um, people that don't want progress, pharmaceutical companies that don't want to be uh, seeing progress. Do you think that it's going to be a hard fight? I mean, granted, We've been saying, like, when I asked you how you've been, you've been, you've been busy. There's a lot that's been happening and a lot of progress been made. Do you feel like the fight is getting easier or people are starting to realize this is the, the only true way to save people longer? I think, yes, it is still a hard fight. I do see some glimmers of hope. And I think people are becoming increasingly tired of this monolithic political establishment, the duopoly, which tries to pit people against one another and get half the country to hate the other half over essentially non-issues, issues that while people may have differences of opinion on them, generally don't affect day-to-day -day life nearly as much as the issues that do matter. For instance, technology or inflation or war, those kinds of issues tend to be ignored by the duopoly. And yet, ordinary people are starting to see what really matters. And they're starting to look for alternatives. There are more people now who are registered as independents politically than as either Democrats or Republicans. And that should be a bellwether of events to come. Now, in most presidential election years, especially even the independents often get pressured into voting for one side or the other uh, because of this pernicious greater evil uh, mentality that, oh, if I don't vote for the lesser evil, then the greater evil will win, whoever that is. And each side will try to portray the other side as a greater evil, like, oh, Donald Trump, he's so corrupt, he's so vulgar, he's going to degrade the character of uh, our politics. And maybe he is. Or Joe or Biden, Biden, he's so he's, young and handsome and yeah, clever. Yeah, he, he's so uh, he's so senescent and incapable of making decisions. And senescent. It, there it is. His advisors are going to lead us to World War Three. Uh, so uh, Trump may be the lesser evil, or uh, according to uh, Biden's apologists, Biden may be the lesser evil. But I would just urge people not to vote to for the most right. the most evil, Gavin Newsom. No, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I would uh, urge people to vote their consciences. So whichever candidate you think is objectively the best, vote for that person, irrespective of what you think that person's chances of winning are, because your individual right vote is not going to shift the outcome of the election. But what your individual vote can do is send a signal to the broader public, as well as to the candidate who does eventually win, that this is a set of ideas. This is a set of policies or a movement that are gaining attention, that deserve to be taken seriously. And if you can communicate that, then even establishment politicians, even politicians who you don't like or who wouldn't agree with you in many situations might be swayed to implement certain policies that are aligned with a desirable future because politicians are not really original thinkers. They're right. not the originators of new bold ideas. They tend to be followers of public opinion. They tend to be more of a barometer, a kind of lagging indicator even of public opinion. 
and they do want to get reelected. So they try to figure out essentially what ideas, what policies are within this Overton window, which is the scope of essentially acceptable ideas for being implemented today. So we want to shift that Overton window, and I'm not going to shift it left or right, I'm going to shift it up. So essentially the scope of possibilities should extend to more futuristic kinds of solutions that leverage science and technology to a greater extent. And if you agree with that, then please support the Transhumanist Party because that is how we get noticed. That is how we get more media coverage. That is how we get more establishment politicians to take our ideas seriously. And yes, vote for us. Also support our effort to get Tom Ross into a presidential debate. It so happens that right. our friends at the Free and Equal Elections Foundation are planning a debate for 2024 for February in Los Angeles. And this debate is going to have six candidates who will be selected by a blockchain-based ranked choice voting poll. And you can find out more about that at freeandequal.org. And there is a fundraiser uh, to which anybody can contribute. It's not a political donation. It's more of a donation to a nonprofit organization. Yes, here it is. So this debate will be moderated by Jimmy Dore, who is a, a progressive leaning comedian and commentator, and Christina Tobin, who has actually run third party presidential debates uh, ever since 2008. She had a famous one in 2012 that was moderated by Larry King. And actually, the Transhumanist Party supported the open debate that was held in 2020 on March 4th in Chicago, where we had 18 candidates from eight different political parties and some independent candidates as well. And it was the best debate of the entire 2020 election season because we had such a wide range of different views and different perspectives, including transhumanist ones. And yet everyone was entirely civil. And yes, probably RFK Jr. will be there uh, at this debate in February in Los Angeles. And we hope Tom Ross will be selected uh, by the uh, audience poll as well. But I think it's just a great opportunity to get more discourse out there, meaningful policy discourse, not just repeating the mainstream talking points uh, or trying to create a false impression of consensus on issues where people really disagree, but seriously engaging those issues and considering what are the best solutions for the future of humanity, for the greatest benefit of as many people as possible. Let me also run over a couple of the initiatives because these are really great. Um, Earthling Initiative, prepare Americans for the technological and economic singularity. So getting ready for what's going to come. And you've seen some of the memes he said, like, do you want to lose your job to a robot or make money off art with the help of AI? Like starting to shift the way we think and teaching kids this. AI initiative, fostering responsible development and integration. Um, extraterrestrial initiative, the ET initiative, uh, achieving disclosure, right? I think a lot of people here would love to see disclosure of whatever technology that we're supposed to believe is advanced or extraterrestrial. We'd like to know more about that because that could probably help people. And the main reason it's being hidden is for war defense, right? So I think that's another thing to consider, but that comes up later. The apex initiative, human trafficking and child exploitation or terrible crimes. Think about how technology can freaking stop it right now. I mean, that's a major reason I care about technology is that it can stop child trafficking and suffering and help raise awareness. Um, AI tutors, education needs to be fixed. Imagine right now kids are just having AI write their papers for them already anyway. Why not have them learn how to use AI and have AI help them to gather information on levels that kids have never been allowed to since education was um, in instilled? Uh, digital defense. This gets back to the idea of defense and democracy and everything else like that. There's all sorts of technology that can be used to make war obsolete in a lot of ways, or at least change violence, make violence something that's gratuitous in war because of the amount of technology that can be used to protect. Um, this is a huge one. We can move to making the military cheaper by doing this. We can get rid of a lot of 
uh, expenses by using digital defense and AI technology and, and AI rights, granting AI rights and safeguard humanity from an ethical human developers who may mistreat or program AI to harm others, right? I mean, the, this is the actual way to, to make sure AI is used properly. We're talking about big corporations making these decisions for themselves or the state doing it, which is even worse. I mean, this is where you can participate in what the, your rights are surrounding AI, as well as the rights of AI itself. And dark audits is a bigger general than just the military, just figuring out where all this money is really going. Why is it going here? How does it work that it goes into a bank account and then that produces 10 times as much money, 100 times as much money in inflation? They're moving it from one country to another. Uh, for dark finance, this is something that needs to be solved. We need to figure that out. And then we are the avatars. Have you ever wondered if our reality is actually a computer simulation? Do you want to know? That's something that they could actually research. It's probably worth doing if you've been listening to some of our conversations because the other way is to like turn off the world, turn off the universe, right? The CERN experiments that some people are saying could lead to full de destruction or anything. I mean, we can test and look for these answers to find out that everything is safe. And what is the real reason we're here? This is beyond philosophy. This becomes pragmatic thinking. Why are we here and what are we? Well, I just think that these are just amazing initiatives that nobody is literally nobody is talking about these things at all at all none of the other can uh, candidates have any interest in uh doing and these are the, these seems like these are the most obvious solutions these are the only pragmatic solutions to these problems yes indeed and we are just looking forward to getting these possibilities recognized by increasing numbers of the general public and getting them discussed, getting them debated so that the American populace and really the population of the entire world can understand what issues are really significant in the coming years and decades. It's not the issues that the mainstream politicians try to divide us over. The issues that really matter are the issues that we as humanity need to tackle together. I also like that it's like whether or not we change the election, we can change consciousness, we can pivot the conversation. And these debates that are happening, everyone will have to follow the curtails of those meta tags and keywords that are brought up and these key points that are brought up. So I appreciate and thank you for doing that. Um, I want to also make sure everyone knows to go to the Transhumanist Party website, uh, transhumanist-party.org. And anywhere else on social media, you can find, including Twitter, x.com, United States Transhumanist Party. Make sure to give you guys an extra follow right there. Um, and what else would you say in terms of people trying to reach out and find you guys? Yes. Yeah, so we have, as you mentioned, an active presence on Twitter. This is my presentation, my brief overview about the Transhumanist Party and what we stand for, how we're different from the political establishment, our core ideals and how we seek to overcome the obstacles of the political system. So uh, please do watch this introductory video. You can sign up for free membership on our website. It takes less than a minute to join. Even if you live outside the United States, you can still become an allied member of the Transhumanist Party. And that will enable you to participate in our internal events and our internal votes, even though obviously you wouldn't be able to vote in U.S. elections. You can still help the Transhumanist Party in terms of our uh, organization of our activities. And furthermore, we hold weekly virtual enlightenment salons every Sunday at 1 p.m. Pacific time, 4 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, this is an example of a salon that we held recently. It was a debate on the future of technological progress, quite interesting, where we had David Patterson arguing that essentially all possible technologies will be developed by the year 2030. And David Wood, who is a great friend and supporter of ours, he's also the founder of London Futurists and one of the founders of Transhumanist UK, uh, which has become Future Surge. It's the uh, counterpart to the US Transhumanist Party in the United Kingdom. He was arguing that, you no, know, we have a much longer way to go in terms of technological progress. And these debates are also quite useful because 
they are very civil, non-adversarial explorations of these issues on the cutting edge, these really interesting questions. We had a debate on artificial intelligence previously. We had another debate on the war in Ukraine, and I'm happy to moderate others. But many of our salons are more discussions than debates. We generally invite guests who have some sort of expertise in science, in technology, in philosophy, in politics, in art. And we try to have these long-form conversations with our guests that really try to bridge various disciplines. So this is an interview that I did with Ray Kurzweil on stage in 2018. Ray Kurzweil- He's just done, done such a fantastic job, by the way. Really great interview. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Ray Kurzweil does not present in live settings very often generally <laughs> indeed at video conferences in so this was a kind of rare opportunity where i asked him essentially about some of the implications of the ai technology that he was working on at google including some topics that have really become quite relevant for instance uh, the subject of privacy around AI technology, and he addressed that very eloquently. So this interview is now a bit more than five years old, but still quite timely, I would say. And Absolutely. And so underviewed. I mean, I feel like this has changed your lives. You have to, I'm just going to recommend everyone watch this because if you really wonder about what's going on in the pragmatic approach and what problems that they're facing, I mean, Ray's talking about it. It's great. Yes, indeed. So we hold these kinds of in-depth conversations every week now. We started during the pandemic, during the lockdown era, when really that was the only way to communicate. But we have definitely persevered and continued this, uh, even as the world has opened up, because this is also a transhumanist technology, by the way. FM 2030, the great proto-transhumanist thinker, called it telepresence. And in the 1980s, mm -hmm. he essentially predicted that by this time, we would have the ability to essentially instantaneously communicate with anyone all over the world. So you can see here, a lot of our officer team held this session. Sometimes uh, we gather our officers together and do a Q&A where we just answer questions from our audience. And you see Tom Ross and Daniel Tweed right. were there as well. So we are very open to engaging the public. I think that's one of the strengths of our organization. We're going to uh, do uh, what you're doing here, Andreas, as well, uh, in our virtual enlightenment salons. We'll highlight questions, comments. So please join again every Sunday, 1 p.m. Pacific time, 4 p.m. Eastern time on my YouTube channel. We tackle challenging questions. We tackle critiques or criticisms as well. So nothing is really off limits in terms of our ability to engage with it rationally and constructively. That's amazing. I'm just making sure I didn't miss anyone's pressing questions here, but I think you, you did a wonderful job, Janati. We're going to have to do it again soon. Uh, thank you again. And I hope to maybe I'll join you very soon on one of these salons because I know that you're having just amazing talks, amazing episodes there. And I hope everyone makes, you know, heard that. Go watch them because they're deep. They're deep episodes in every direction. Yes. Thank you very much, Andreas. And we would be quite thrilled to have you as a guest on oh. one of our salons. Yeah, well, you don't have to yeah, twist my arm about it, why don't you? Okay, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. I appreciate that you let me invite myself on. Yeah, sounds fun. <laughs> All right, well, I'll see you soon then. Take care of yourself. Absolutely. Live long and prosper. Peace, bro. This next story has been suppressed by mainstream media. Let's go to Andreas for more. Everybody, tune in to Recent Tartarians. Recent Tartarians. Recent Hello, welcome to the Exatos. Tune in for another exciting episode of Wonder, Imagination and Discovery. Recent Tartarians! Recent Tartarians!
Фундаментальные образуют всеобщие закономерности, определяющие законы классической физики. Для нашего мира. Что касается энергии нано, то она превышает ядерную в немыслимое число раз. 10 в 74 степени. Thank you for watching Exodus. Keep listening. Remember, if you enjoyed the video, please follow and subscribe and share and support. It really helps. Coming up next, Exodus. By the way, that's gone. You didn't record that. That's gone forever. It's gone.